Hello and welcome to A Short History Of. I am your host, Neil Taylor, otherwise known as The Kid Dog, and this time... I'm not going to do a lot of waffling because I get the feeling this video is going to be quite a long one. We are tackling one of the biggies. And what do I mean by biggies? I mean, I have done PlayStation. No, we're talking about the Atari 2600. Yes. Once referred to by IGN as the console that the games industry is built upon. Remember, if you like the video, give it a thumbs up. If you dislike the video, give it a thumbs down. Leave a comment down below and subscribe to the channel. Let's get on with a short history of the Atari 2600. The Atari 2600, or the Atari VCS before 1982, is a home video game console released on September the 11th, 1977 by Atari Incorporated. It is credited with popularising the microprocessor-based hardware and ROM cartridges containing game code, a format first used with the Fairchild Channel F video game console in 1976. The format contrasts with older models of having non-microprocessor-dedicated hardware, which could only play the game which was physically built into the unit. The console was originally sold as the Atari VCS, an abbreviation from Video Computer System. Following the release of the Atari 5200 in 1982, the VCS was renamed the Atari 2600 after the unit's Atari part number, CX2600. The 2600 was typically bundled with two joystick controllers, a conjoined pair of paddle controllers, and a game cartridge, initially Combat and later Pac-Man. Ted Dabney and Nolan Bushnell developed the Atari gaming system in the 1970s. Originally operating under the name Synergy, or Syzygy, Bushnell and Debney changed the name of their company to Atari in 1972. In 1973, Atari Inc. had purchased an engineering think tank called Cry Engineering to research the next generation video game systems and had been working on a prototype known as Stella, named after one of the engineer's bicycles, for some time. Unlike prior generations of machines that use custom logic to play a small number of games, its core is a complete CPU, the famous MOS Technology 6502, and a cost-reductive version known as the 6507. It was combined with a RAM and I.O. chip, the MOS Technology 6532, and display and sound chip known as the Television Interface Adapter, or TIA. The first two versions of the machine contained a fourth chip, a standard CMOS logic buffer IC, making the seller cost-effective. Programs for small computers of the time were generally stored on cassette tape, floppy disk, or paper tape. By the early 1970s, Hewlett-Packard manufactured desktop computers costing thousands of dollars such as the HP 9830, which packaged read-only memory into removable cartridges to add special program features, and these were being considered for use in games. At first, the design was not going to be cartridge-based, but after seeing a fake cartridge system on another machine, they realised they could place the games on cartridges, essentially for the price of connectors and packaging. In 1976, Fairchild Semiconductors released their own CPU-based system, the Video Entertainment System. Stella was not ready for production, but it was clear that it needs to be before there were a number of Me Too products filling up the market, which happened after they released Pong. Atari Inc. didn't have the cash flow to complete with the system as quickly, given the sales of their Pong system were cooling. Nolan Bushnell eventually turned to Warner Communications and sold the company to them in 1976 for $28 million, on the promise that Stella would be produced as soon as possible. The key to the eventual success of the machine was the hiring of Jay Miner, a chip designer who managed to squeeze an entire wire warp of equipment, making up the TIA into a single chip. Once that was complete and debugged, the system was ready for shipping. The unit was originally priced at $199. US Adjusted for inflation today, that's $770, and shipped with two joysticks and combat cartridge. Eight additional games were available at launch and sold separately. In a move to compete direct with the Channel F, Atari Inc. named the machine the Video Computer System, or VCS for short, as the Channel F was at that point known as the VES, for Video Entertainment System. The VCS was also rebadged as the Sears Video Arcade and sold through Sears. Another breakthrough for the gaming system was Atari's invention of a computer-controlled opponent rather than the usual two-player or asymmetric challenges of the past. When Fairchild learned of Atari Inc.'s naming, they quickly changed the name of their system to become the Channel F. However, both systems were in the midst of a vicious round of price cutting. Pong clones that had been made obsolete by the newer and more powerful machines were sold off to discounters for even lower prices. Soon, many of the clone companies were out of business and both Fairchild and Atari Inc. were selling to a public that was completely burnt out on Pong. In 1977, Atari Inc. sold 250,000 video computer systems. For the first year of production, the video computer system was manufactured in Sunnyvale, California. The consoles manufactured there had thick plastic moulding around the side and bottoms. Those added weight to the console and because all six switches were on the front, these consoles were nicknamed the Heavy Sixers. After the first year, production moved to Hong Kong and the console manufactured there had thinner plastic moulding. In 1978, only 550,000 units from a production run of 800,000 were sold, requiring further financial support from Warner to cover the losses. 
This led directly to a disagreement that caused Atari Inc. founder Nolan Bushnell to leave the company in 1978. Despite Bushnell's retirement in 1978, Warner Robinette's invention of the first graphical adventure game, Adventure, was developed the same year and changed the fundamentals of gaming as it unlocked the game with a virtual space bigger than the screen. Once the public realised it was possible to play video games other than Pong and programmers learned how to push its hardware capabilities, the VCS gained popularity. By this point, Fairchild had given up thinking video games were a passing fad, thereby handing the entire quickly growing market to Atari. By 1979, the VCS was the best-selling Christmas gift and console due to exclusive content and 1 million units were sold that year. Atari then licensed the Smash Arcade hit Space Invaders by Taito which greatly increased the unit's popularity when it was released in January 1980, doubling sales to over 2 million units. The VCS and its cartridges were the main factor behind Atari Inc. grossing more than $2 billion in 1980. Sales then doubled again for the next two years. By 1982, the year I was born, the console had sold 10 million units, while its best-selling game, Pac-Man, sold 7 million copies. The console also sold 450,000 units in West Germany by 1984. By 1982, the 2600 console cost Atari about $40 to make and was selling for an average of $125. The company spent $4.50 to $6 manufacturing each cartridge and $1 to $2 for advertising and sold it for $18.95 wholesale. In 1980, the VCS was given a minor revision in which the left and right difficulty switches were moved to the back of the console, leaving four switches on the front. Other than this, these four switch consoles look nearly identical to the earlier six switch models. In 1982, another version of the 4-Switch console was released without wood grain. They were nicknamed Darth Vader consoles due to their all-black appearance. These were also the first consoles to be officially called the Atari 2600 after the Atari 5200 was released the same year. During this period, Atari expanded the 2600 family with two other compatible consoles. Despite the forward panelling and what would now appear to be primitive graphics, the game console would become widely popular for the time. Later, however, they designed the Atari 2700, a wireless version of the console that was never released because of design flaws. The company also built a sleeker version of the machine dubbed the Atari 2800 to sell directly to the Japanese market in early 1983, but it suffered from competition with the newly released Nintendo Famicom. In a survey mentioned by Jeff Rogan, it is reported that more stores reported breakdowns of the Atari 2600 system than any other, and that Atari repair centers seemed to have the most trouble with consoles manufactured in 1980. In one case, it was stated that a system was repaired five times before static electricity from a carpet was discovered to have caused the problem. The controllers were also a source of breakages because of the way they could be gripped by a player holding it with their fist, allowing players to get carried away and over control, which was less likely with other systems released at the time, such as the Magnavox Odyssey 2, which has controllers that are nearly half the size. Atari also continued their OEM relationship with Sears under the latter's Telgames brand label, which started in 1975 with the original Pong. Sears released several versions of the 2600 as the Sears Video Arcade System from 1977 to 1983. These also included the Rev-A Heavy Sixer models in 1977, the Rev-B Four Switch model in 1980, and the US version of the Atari 2800 branded as the Sears Video Arcade 2 in 1983. Sears also released their own versions of Atari's games under the Tell Games brand, often with different titles. Three games were also produced by Atari for Sears as exclusive releases under the Tell Games brand. Steeplechase, Stellar Track, and Submarine Commander. Sears Tell Games brand was unrelated to the company Tell Games, which also produced cartridges for the Atari 2600, mostly reissues of M-Network games. During the 1970s, Atari Inc. continued to grow until it had one of the largest R&D divisions in Silicon Valley. However, it spent most of its R&D budget on projects that seemed out of place at a video game or even home computer company. Many of these projects never saw the light of day. Meanwhile, several attempts to bring out newer consoles failed for one reason or another, although Atari Inc.'s home computer system, the Atari 8-bit family, sold reasonably well. Warner was pleased as it seemed to have no end of the sales of the 2600 and Atari was responsible for over half the company's income. The programmers of many Atari's biggest hits grew disgruntled with the company for not crediting game developers and many left the company to form their own independent software companies. The most prominent of these long-lasting of third-party developers was Activision, founded in 1980 whose titles quickly became more popular than those of Atari itself. Atari attempted to block third-party development for the 2600 in court but failed and soon after other publishers such as Coleco entered the market. Atari suffered from an image problem when a company named Majestic produced a number of pornographic games for the 2600. The most notorious of these was Custer's Revenge, which was protested by women's and Native Americans groups because it depicted General George Armstrong Custer raping a bound Native American woman. Atari sued Mystique and Court over the release of the game. Atari also continued to acquire licenses for the 2600, the most prominent of which include Pac-Man, 
and E.T. Public disappointment with these two titles and the market saturation of poor third party titles are cited as a major contributor to the video game crash of 1983. Suddenly, Atari's growth meant it was losing massive amounts of money during the crash, at one point about $10,000 a day. Warner quickly grew tired of supporting Atari and started looking for buyers in 1984. By mid-1984, most software development for the 2600 had stopped, except by Atari and Activision, with third-party developers emphasising ColecoVision games. Although not formally discontinued, the 2600 was de-emphasised for two years after Warner's 1984 sale of Atari Inc.'s consumer division to Commodore Business Machines founder Jack Tremiel, who wanted to concentrate on home computers. He ended all development of console games, including the 2600 Garfield game and the Atari 5200 port of Super Pac-Man. Due to the large library and low price point, the 2600 and the 2600 Junior continued to sell late into the 1980s and was not discontinued until 1992. In 1986, a new version of the 2600 was released. This newly redesigned version of the 2600, unofficially referred to as the 2600 Junior, featured a smaller, cost-reduced form factor with a modernised Atari 7800-like appearance. The redesigned 2600 was advertised as a budget gaming system, usually retailing around $50, that has the ability to run a large collection of classic games. The Atari 2600 continued to sell in North America and Europe until 1991, and in Asia until the early 90s. In 2007, the Atari 2600 was introduced into the Tall Hall of Fame with, with 40 million units sold in its lifetime, and the youngest toy to be introduced. In Brazil, the console became extremely popular in the mid-1980s. The Atari 2600 was officially retired by Atari Corp on January 1st, 1992, making it, at the time, the longest-lived home video game console, 14 years and 4 months in video game history. It was later surpassed by the Sega Master System, click a link somewhere to see the video, a console which never formally ended production in Brazil. The Atari 2600 was also at the time the best-selling American-made console, selling 30 million units. This record would later be broken by the Xbox 360, which sold 84 million units. The system was promoted in a United Kingdom TV ad in 1989 in the run-up to Christmas in which it claimed the fun was back. The advertising campaign used its price of under £50 as a selling point. The advert was a redubbed version of the original campaign in the United States. Also, the 2600 Junior was originally to be packaged with a Proline joystick, the same one used as the Atari 7800, but when it was released, it instead included the original CX40 joystick. Later European versions of the 2600 included a joypad, which also featured with the European 7800. In 1977, nine games were released on cartridges to accompany the launch of the machine, including Outlaw, Space War, and Breakout. During the console's lifetime, Atari and Atari Corp published many titles. These games included Adventure, Breakout, and Yars Revenge. The console's popularity attracted many third-party developers, which led to the popular titles such as Atari's Pitfall and Atlantis. However, two Atari-published titles, E.T. and Pac-Man, are frequently blamed for contributing to the video game crash of 1983. The Atari 2600 was wildly successful, and during much of the 1980s, Atari was synonymous for the, this model of mainstream media, and by extension, for video games in general. In 2009, the Atari 2600 was named the second greatest video game console of all time by IGN, which cited its remarkable role as the console behind both the first video game boom and the video game crash of 1983, and called it the console that our entire industry is built upon. The console and its old and new games are very popular with collectors because of its significant impact on the video game and consumer electronic history, and also due to its nostalgic value for many people, along with a number of games that are still considered highly playable. In addition, modern Atari 2600 clones remain on the market. One example is the Atari Classics 10-in-1 TV game, manufactured by Jack Specific, which emulates a 2600 console and includes converted versions of 10 games into a single Atari-branded looking joystick with composite video outputs for connecting directly to modern televisions. Another is the TV Boy, which features 127 games in an enlarged joypad. The Atari Flashback 2 console, released in 2005, contained 40 games with 4 additional programs unlocked by a cheat code. The console implements the original 2600 architecture and can be modified to play original 2600 cartridges by adding a cartridge port and is also compatible with original 2600 controllers. Thank you very much for watching a short history of the Atari 2600. Hopefully you found that a very enjoyable. Apologies if it did run a little bit long, but there's a lot to talk about with the Atari 2600 and Atari in general, seeing as they did play such a major role in the beginning of the video games industry. We are by no means done with Atari. I, I can imagine there's quite a lot more that I need to talk about, like the Atari 8-bit family, Atari the company itself. So there's plenty in there to talk about. So we will be revisiting that. Thank you very much for watching. If you like the video, give me a thumbs up. If you dislike the video, give it a thumbs down. Leave a comment down below and subscribe to the channel. And next week we will be back 
to Ridge Racer. No, not with Ridge Racer, but with Rage Racer. Because they randomly decided to change the name because reasons. Thanks very much, and see you next time.